Um, thanks, it's very great to be here. Um, let me just tell you about how I'm going to approach this talk today. My expectation is that many of you in your own communities are actually the peer leaders and content experts within the area of STIs and HIV. So I'm actually going to do a relatively deep dive into some pretty key changes that have happened. And I'm doing that because I know that your peers will likely be coming to you to have better understanding of it. So that's sort of the intent of the topic uh, today. Um, this is my disclosure slide. Uh, and I really do feel that uh, in many ways, uh, what we're talking about today is really a back to the future kind of thing. A lot of uh, history is coming back to repeat itself. And so uh, if you keep the lens of history in mind, I think that will help you understand about where we are with STIs and HIV in this province. Um, the, the big thing I'm going to really review today are twofold. There's two big things. One is changes in gonorrhea recommendations, treatment recommendations for gonorrhea. And the second is an update on the syphilis epidemic in British Columbia. And finally, I I'm, will talk a little bit about some screening recommendations, but really what I want you to leave with are those two areas in terms of syphilis and, and gonorrhea. But let's start right at the beginning with what is an STI. And I think sometimes we just forget about why we have these definitions. So uh, STI is defined as an infection uh, transmitted through sexual contact. And I think the unique element about STIs is they're actually dependent exclusively on behavioral factors. So individuals who do not have sexual intercourse will not contract STIs. But remember, they're very broad definitions and increasingly broad definitions of what sexual practice is. And so that includes vaginal intercourse, anal intercourse, and oral intercourse. So you have to keep those in mind when you're thinking about exposures to STIs. Um, STIs are also uh, divided into those that are commonly transmitted through a sexual intercourse, and then those that can, be, that can be transmitted through sexual intercourse, but not exclusively. So first we have things such as HSV, HPV, TRIC, pubic lice, as well as our regular uh, reportable diseases, gonorrhea, chlamydia, et cetera, that are all, uh, all more exclusively uh, transmitted through sexual intercourse. But then we have infections such as candida, giardia, hep A and B and C, molluscum, scabies, that can be transmitted as part of sexual contact, but also can be transmitted uh, in other ways. So. The keys for uh, STIs, and this is a bit of just uh, epi, uh, epi grounding, but I think it's really important for us to remember that there's a fraction of the community that's at risk. And the intensity of transmission is not obviously related to population density. And why that's important is we do have this important concept of sexual networks. Everyone who engages in sex is at risk for ac acquiring, but there are certain networks that people participate in where they're more at risk for acquiring because the density of infections within that network is greater. The other one of the big challenges we have with STIs is the presence of the carrier state particularly things such as chlamydia, folks know that, that people can be asymptomatic and but be very effective at transmitting. There is uh, little or no immunity that can actually uh, prevent uh, these infections. So, and we're going to talk a little bit about the role of reinfection as an emerging challenge for STI management and control. Uh, there's variability in the courses of infection. And of course, there's heterogeneity in the actual transmission per coital act, so per act, because you have different risks of transmission, whether it's anal, vaginal, or oral intercourse. And that's been parsed out very extensively. And the characteristics that will predict transmission per act is really based on three key things. And everyone will remember the reproductive rate equation. But when you, when you take it to the level of sexual uh, activity, we look at beta, which is the average probability per sexual contact. And that can really be responsive, respond and change based on what the act is. The average duration of the infectiousness of an infected person, and this is really where we focus as practitioners. We want we try to decrease the duration of infectiveness by uh, infectiousness by actually screening people as quickly as we can and improving access to care and treating as quickly as we can, making treatment available as quickly as we can. And then C, which is the average number of sexual partners per unit time, looking at the networks that people are in. So those are some of the key predictors of uh, STI rates and STI uh, um, dynamics in a community. So where are we going? Um, actually, we're showing some uh, interesting improvements in particularly adolescent sexual health, where we have, uh, using the McCreary survey, we actually see the percentage of youth who ever had uh, sexual intercourse decrease both for males and females. 
We also have an increased report of those who use condoms at last intercourse increased over the past 10 years. And we've also had a report where we see that the percentage of those who had first intercourse before the age of 14 decreased for both sexes. But that's not the whole story, and, and Barb Arnold and I were talking about this uh, yesterday because one of the things that sexual health surveys have not yet caught up to is actually some of the sexual practices of individuals. So while we may have a change in vaginal uh, intercourse, what we don't have rates of is, for instance, anal intercourse, and we don't have great rates of oral uh, intercourse either. So while there's some good news on that front, we have to keep in mind the broader range of sexual practices. We also see some uh, decreases in reported rates of forced intercourse, which is a very good thing. And also, and this is where I think it's very important for primary care practitioners, the importance and the very, very clear importance of protective factors such as connections to family and school as being uh, associated with lower odds of having engaged in risky sexual practices. So very clear that kids who feel supported, feel engaged, feel part of a community, part of their school, will be less likely to report STIs. Okay, so that's sort of that background. Let's go to gonorrhea. I always like to say that, that I deal in the glamour diseases and it's very exciting at cocktail parties to mention the work I do because everyone disperses rapidly. <laughs> and, and as someone said, so when I said that to someone, they said, ooh, that's a great way to get people out of my house if they won't leave. So feel free to try that. Um, the epidemiology of gonorrhea. So like I said, I'm going to talk about gonorrhea and then give some highlights on syphilis. Gonorrhea is the second most uh, common reported STI in BC. We've got about 1,300 cases reported a year. And we've had a gradual but steady increase since the late 1990s. And just so you know, we're seeing this both in males but also in young females for particularly 15 to 24-year-olds. So here we go with our history lesson. Uh, former gonorrhea treatment recommendations. I've been practicing at BCCDC for 10 years, Barb, you around the same amount of time, and we've gone through at least three recommendations for uh, gonorrhea. So this is an area that, uh, they, they call it the wily gonococcus, I'll show you a slide later. But it, the, the changes are moving rapidly. So when I started, we were using ciprofloxacin as a medication. That's now off the books. And then we were very excited about the use of oral uh, cephalosporins, particularly suffixing 400 POD. And then the alternatives remain, particularly ceftriaxone, uh, IM, uh, azithro, two grams PO. But that's had a few problems in that we do have some, I'll talk a little bit about some of the res resistant issues, but also some tolerability issues with two grams of azithro. And then uh, cipro and afloxacin and spectinomycin. So that was what it was. Uh, we moved to that in about 2007. But this is now a history lesson. The Wiley gonococcus, and here is the litany of medications that uh, GC has developed resistance to. Penicillin, tetracycline, ciprofloxacin, cefixime, and now some cases even of ceftriaxone. And like I said, a lot of this is about history. Um, this is an, uh, from the U.S. archives in 1941 uh, and just showing uh, the issues with gonor uh, resistant gonorrhea even back then. So the threat to suffixing. What we've been noticing globally is that the mean inhibitory concentration of antimicrobials that are required to actually kill the, kill the um, uh, organism has been rising. And you can see, particularly in the U.S., on the far slide, you can see uh, the West has one of the highest rates, the rising, rapidly rising rates of the MIC that's needed to eradicate the organism, and particularly then with a, uh, GC that's been isolated from men who have sex with men. And this is the same with Cipro. We, the West seems to be the harbinger of things to come. And I, you guys can postulate why that is, but that, that is our reality. So that's what we're seeing in the US. And this is for suffixing, which is the oral medication we've been using. Perhaps more concerning for many of us is actually ceftriaxone, which is the IM treatment. We have two reported cases of, fer of, of resistant uh, specimens, one urethral, one pharyngeal, that was resistant to ceftriaxone. So very concerning. Uh, and I do think, and, and I'm going to summarize at the end of it the two lessons I want folks to take. We are heading into an era of multidrug treatment for gonorrhea, and that is what we need to do is be very diligent about that because right now the multidrug is two. Let's hope we can keep it at two drugs.
So we'll, we'll get to that, but that, that's going to be the key message. So as I said, we have a dubious distinction in the West of being the harbinger of things to come. We saw that with Cipro, and now we're starting to see that with, uh, with uh, this Cephalosporins. One of the big things then that changed, obviously, for GC and for us keeping on top of this is our testing practices. Uh, Barb Arnold and I and Marisa Collins also had the privilege of working with Linda Knowles, who was a, a senior nurse who has had years of experience. And when the nucleic acid testing came in, I still remember her saying, and she was one of those old school sort of head nurse kind of people. She was tremendous, tremendous force. And she, she said, we are not getting rid of cultures. I don't care about all this fancy nucleic acid <laughs> testing stuff. And we just sort of, yes, Linda, OK, whatever you say, Linda. But of course, she was right, because our testing practices changed. And then when we needed to be monitoring our antimicrobial resistance, everyone had appropriately moved to NAT testing because of the improved sensitivity, because of the appeal for particularly young men with urine testing. But one of the key control metrics and measures that we have, which is actually monitoring resistance testing, or resistance patterns we weren't able to do. So Linda insisted at the provincial STI clinic, and we are grateful to her, that we keep doing cultures, which we did. Uh, and what we did was we, we test about, uh, we were able to have um, uh, samples over the past, if we look at over the past uh, eight years, or seven years, you can see that we have about 22% of all the cases we have cultures on. And many of this is done at the Provincial Public Health Lab through our clinic at the BC Center for Disease Control. And what you can see is just, again, some historical perspective, increasing uh, resistant patterns for penicillin, tetracycline, and cephalosporins, and, and ciprofloxacin. You can see that there's a huge percentage of uh, most of our isolates now that are uh, cipro-resistant. And here's the MIC creep for the cephalosporins. And you can see that an increasing percentage now, and let me just be clear, this is not resistant, but they require a higher concentration of the presence of the uh, antibiotic for the organism to be eradicated, okay? So it's not that they're resistant, but we require a higher concentration. Now you can see that's both with, uh, with cefixime, but again also with ceftriaxone. It's very, very concerning. We also see that with azithromycin and increasing uh, MIC required to uh, to eradicate the organism. We also have started to see, we, we see a trend in terms of sites where the lowest, uh, the low, we have the fewest problems with cervix and the highest challenges with uh, anal specimens. So uh, rectal specimens, then throat, urethra, and then cervix that have the resistance patterns. Uh, and, and we similarly then see this with cefixine, ceftriaxone, and azithromycin that specimens that are uh, from the rectal sites have the highest MICs, then throat, then urethra, and then cervix. And why I'm telling you all this is it'll help to sort of elucidate why the recommendations are what they are. Uh, so again, here's just some pictures of our first line treatments. In British Columbia, we've seen a change where we've moved from not, not particularly seeing any uh, issues with our MICs to starting to see the trends as I showed you earlier. So the big message is we have a rise in the MICs uh, for cefixime, ceftriaxone, and azithromycin over the time period, and that it's, there's a disparity by site. So what are the clinical, clinical implications? Well, I think it's impacted on our choice of screening tests, it's impacted on our need for follow-up, and it's impacted on our need for surveillance and treatment. There's a change in the national STI guidelines in December 2011. And we made those changes, we recommended those changes in British Columbia in January 2012. So let me just go over a few of those. So the first thing is testing. No longer can we continue to resort to the convenience of gnats at the expense of the bacterial culture. And I think that's a good, uh, important message. So what we are recommending now is urethral swab is, uh, so back to cultures, is preferred for, for symptomatic clients and for clients who are sexual contacts. And this is all available on the BCCDC website, so you don't, you don't need to take too many notes. And certainly if someone has a discharge, it's actually very easy to take a swab. Uh, if someone's a contact, it's a little bit more uncomfortable, obviously, to take a urethral swab, but we do recommend that. Uh, 
and I'm going to show you that every regional health authority has a lab that is now able to culture and so you can send those to those specific labs and then any positive cultures get sent to BC Centre for Disease Control where we do uh, specific antimicrobial testing. Let me be clear that it doesn't mean you shouldn't do a NAT. Okay, you don't need to, you can still do your urine testing and we know, and I don't want to have us lose urine testing because of course the sensitivity of urine testing is higher than the sensitivity of culture. So what we're saying is that if you're worried particularly for symptomatic clients, particularly for contacts, please make sure you are able to get a culture as well. You can see the recommendations for the urine specimen. Ideally, the client should not avoid it for the previous two hours and, and collect the first 10 to 20 mils or collect after the swab. Um, and certainly, uh, as I said, NAT may continue to be collected as the only diagnostic test if the client is asymptomatic and the, or the client's unable to tolerate a swab. Let's be clear, the most important thing is to get the, the test. And if the client's unable or unwilling to tolerate a swab, that then we, we stay with NAT testing. Uh, there's also then thinking about throat culture and anal culture if indicated with uh, sexual history. For females, um, we, uh, with no physical assessment findings, but sexual uh, history indicates a need for diagnostics. Uh, think about a cervical swab for NAT. But if women are presenting with symptoms or, as I, or are identified as a sexual contact, please consider doing both uh, culture and uh, NAT uh, testing. And here's, uh, I believe these are in your slides, here's the uh, location where um, uh, GC culture testing is available. And as you can see, also the private labs have been very responsive uh, in making uh, culture available as well across the province. Okay, and so then let's look at the treatment. And again, you don't have to memorize these. The, the, I think the two key messages to think about is that now it's dual treatment, okay? It's always dual treatment for uh, gonorrhea. Um, and as I said, I wanted to give you all the background so you understand a bit of the rationale. We have divided out MSM, so men who have sex with men, and, uh, and others. So, uh, and that's because I showed you earlier that the rectal specimens have the highest rates of uh, antimicrobial um, resistance. So the preferred treatment for pharyngeal and for anogenital infection in MSM is actually ceftriaxone. And you'll notice we've doubled the dose from before. It used to be 125, it's now 250. And also co-treatment with uh, azithromycin, okay? The alternate treatments are suffixime 800 PO, and again, we've doubled that dose compared to what we had before, or azithro two grams. I've, I personally have had troubles with folks with azithro. It, it's, it's actually at that dose, people do find it difficult to take. So you need to be, you need to prepare people for the fact that they may have some stomach discomfort. And if they are nauseous and they do uh, vomit, then, then we need to consider that they haven't been treated and, and think about other alternatives. So again, a dual treatment, we've doubled the, in MSM, both pharyngeal, rectal, urethral infection, ceftriaxone is the preferred line of treatment. Let's be clear though, if folks don't want to take an IM uh, injection, it's more important for them to get the medication, uh, the oral medication in at 800 milligrams PO plus their co-treatment with azithro. Again, this is all public health agency guidelines. We have it at BCCDC website. For others, for pharyngeal infections, regardless for men and women, we still recommend ceftriaxone uh, as the first line of therapy, again with co-treatment. And then for other uh, infections, uh, urethral, endocervical, vaginal, rectal in women, uh, you, or in uh, M men who have sex with women, uh, you can use either cefixime or ceftriaxone. And again, always with co-treatment. Test of cure, we're, we're realistic about this. We know that not everyone's going to show up for their test of cure, but we would recommend that you ask folks to come back for a test of cure if symptoms persist for all pregnant women and for all pharyngeal infections. Uh, and that's simply, and of course, if folks have not received the recommended treatment, they're also recommended to come for test of cure. Um, 
when women are MSM received a treatment other than the combination of ceph cefixime or ceftriaxone with azithromycin. And also, if MSM are treated and they don't want to take ceftriaxone and they take um, uh, cefixime, or, then they should also be recommended to come for a test of cure. Also, clients who are received antibiotics linked to a case who had treatment failure or demonstrated resistance of that same antimicrobial uh, should come back. And also think about repeat testing at six months due to the potential <coughs> high risk of reinfection. And that's in keeping also with our chlamydia guidelines where people are advised to return in six months for repeat screening. So lots of content there. I recognize that I'm throwing a lot at you. My bottom line is when you're treating gonorrhea, take a moment, go to the PHAC guidelines, go to the BCCDC website and get your uh, recommendations there. Also, the BCCDC Provincial STI Clinic, we are always happy to receive calls and to advise. Barb Arnold here is one of our key clinic physician leads. Barb, did you have any other comments you wanted to make? Was that good? Yeah. She'll be one of the folks you'll be talking to <laughs> with, with, on the phone. Uh, so what the future holds, and I think this was uh, from that same, same uh, talk. Uh, simply increasing the doses of extended spectrum cephalosporins will likely prove ineffective and has been a lesson learned for all single agent therapies used for gonorrhea to date. We recommend dual therapy uh, be used and there is urgent action required at an international level to combat the problem of then gonorrhea antimicrobial resistance as we are in for gloomy times ahead in terms of GC disease and control. So we're really actually at quite a threshold for this very common infection. And I think many of us worry about what we, for those of us who work also with folks in TB, we worry about where we might be heading uh, with GC. Okay, and back to the basics. Uh, remembering and reminding folks about prevention, uh, about the role of their partners and the role of uh, using condoms in uh, their sexual practices. Okay, and I do always just like to remind people that actually prevention is effective. And so when practitioners, have been great data in the States, it actually shows that if you actually engage with some counseling and if you support people in how to be, and, and it's particularly things like helping them problem solve, role play, what are the barriers, you can actually really uh, impact on people's use of condoms. And that will have an impact ultimately. Because if people just re-enter the sexual network from which they acquired their infection, our rates will just continue. OK. Um, where's my moderator? Where are you? How much time do I have left? Um, three minutes. Three. And then, well, you have eight minutes. Eight minutes. OK, great. So I'm going to take the eight minutes. Um, just a little bit of a flag about syphilis, and I think the bottom line for syphilis, and if, you know, sort of to the take-home message, is we again have another syphilis epidemic, and, and Barb can actually tell you about the, the phone calls. I think last Monday we had 11 uh, cases. So it's busy times in the world of syphilis, uh, particularly in our MSM community, in, uh, and in, it's particularly in the Lower Mainland. So one of the things I really want folks to think about is syphilis has very specific uh, uh, symptoms, but it also has very nonspecific symptoms. So you need to keep in mind screening for syphilis, particularly uh, for folks who are um, for MSM and for anyone who has new who has sexual partners. Um, so the, and let me also just outline for you that uh, syphilis treatment is supported by uh, the BC Centre for Disease Control. So we have access to the bicillin and can walk you through what recommendations should be, uh, what treatments should be given based on your client's RPRs. Uh, syphilis, uh, in terms of history, has a very dubious distinction. I think that uh, uh, there's widely held views that folks like Henry VIII had it, uh, Shakespeare, a lot of his uh, references in many of his plays spoke about syphilis. So it's certainly uh, been around for a long, long time. And it also has the dubious distinction of being part of some pretty uh, infamous uh, public health trials as well. So sexual transmission, uh, oral, anal, and vaginal, and uh, also some skin-to-skin -skin contact with open sores. And certainly during pregnancy, we see congenital syphilis, which is, of course, very fortunately uncommon in BC because we're quite aggressive about our syphilis management. It is the great imitator 
Uh, and there's, of course, the, the phases of syphilis. Infectious syphilis, where we have primary, which is symptomatic, three days to three months. Secondary syphilis, uh, two weeks to about six months. And then early latent, which is uh, no symptoms, but first time, any time in that first year. And then, of course, late latent. And the diagnosis is a combination of clinical findings, diagnostic tests, and health history. Uh, so just a reminder, uh, so the primary is usually a solitary, painless uh, nodule uh, at the site of exposure. So it can be found in the mouth, genitals, rectum, and vagina. And the lesion will usually last for about one month. And depending on the timing of when you screen, the screening actually may or may not be reactive. So you need to keep that in mind uh, if you have a clinical suspicion. And uh, no STI presentation would be uh, complete without requisite pictures. So here are some examples of, of chancres that we've uh, seen over the years. Secondary syphilis, uh, usually the, the classic rash on the trunk, palm, soles, or genitals. But we also see some other presentations of it, lymphadenopathy, condylomalata, fever and malaise. And usually by this time, the RPR is reactive, uh, about one in eight or higher. And, uh, you know, the pathognomonic um, rash on the, 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 the palms and soles of the feet, but also uh, can be distributed throughout the, bo the body. And then early latent, which is usually within one year. And again, the RPR is usually reactive, one in eight or higher. And uh, there'll be uh, evidence of recent infection or risk of infection, and often a history of uh, non-reactive serology, so they will have had a negative serology in the past or a history of symptoms as well. And in BC, we have also a early latent probable where the folks have no symptoms, but the RPR is uh, reactive, but they've actually not had screening in the past year. And often there's a clinical history that's, that's consistent with risk for acquisition. Um, the big complications, of course, are you get damage to all sorts of different systems. And I particularly want to just highlight for you neurosyphilis. We've had some actually really tragic cases uh, over the past year uh, where folks have, uh, neurosyphilis can occur at any stage of infection. And I think what's interesting is what we were traditionally taught was neurosyphilis was more of a later presentation. What we're actually seeing is neurosyphilis paralleling a rise in early syphilis. So it's actually uh, quite problematic. We've had some folks who've actually now have actually permanent sequelae because of uh, neurosyphilis. So uh, something to really keep in mind in the differential of things like a persistent headache, dizziness, all those sort of vague symptoms, and I recognize that they're very vague, and, but it is something that I would ask folks to try to keep in mind when they're reviewing clients. Uh, and of course, congenital syphilis. Now I know uh, screening in pregnancy is well established. Again, with a client who you think uh, has been, uh, may have a risk for, through their partners, uh, to think about uh, repeat testing in the third trimester is also a very good idea. Uh, these are just some examples of the tests. I think the big thing for you to know is particularly in the, uh, uh, for, for primary, that sometimes the RPR will be negative. So you need to keep that uh, differential diagnosis in, in mind. Um, and remember, this, the RPR screen is nonspecific but very sensitive whereas the confirmatory is very specific uh, f for what we're, we're trying to diagnose. Uh, treatment. Uh, again, we'll be, we'll be supporting you through the treatment. Um, bicillin for um, infectious, so primary, secondary, and early latent. You can, bicillin, and I just want to be really just highlight for you that uh, the treatment is actually two shots of 2.4 million units in total. And uh, you can also give doxycycline, 100 milligrams BID for 14 days, or azithro, but our first treatment, our first line of treatment is obviously bicillin. Secondary late stage uh, syphilis, it's three sets of bicillin uh, at uh, over three weeks. And again, there's the alternatives, but, but not what we would prefer. We prefer folks using bicillin whenever they can. Uh, so, yep, back to the concept of history. Again, you can see the oscillating nature of syphilis. So we are at epidemic highs, but we have actually seen rates this high in the past, certainly in the late 70s. And one of the key messages that I want you to leave is there is a uh, predominance of syphilis in the MSM network right now. So we are seeing a lot of our cases in, in folks who are men who have sex with men. Uh, it's not that it's not in, in street-involved sex trade workers or heterosexuals, but certainly the, the MSM are shouldering the biggest burden of the disease right now. 
I think the other thing, and maybe I'll, leave, I'll close on this point, is uh, just the concept of reinfection. And this is actually, we're actually looking very closely at the concept of reinfection. Right now with our chlamydia rates, our gonorrhea rates, and our syphilis rates, what we're seeing is that the number of folks who've been infected before and treated and have reacquired from different partners is increasing and they're representing a larger burden or larger proportion of the individuals with the disease. Certainly with, with uh, uh, syphilis reinfection, what we found was that 15% of the clients who have syphilis uh, last year actually had had a previous diagnosis, 15% and about 3% had had greater than three diagnoses. So that's back to the point that I discussed earlier about the role of prevention, the role of the fact that if folks are re-engaging back in the same sexual network and there's still a, you know, a highly, it's a dense sexual network with um, a, prevalence, a high prevalence of the disease, the risk for reacquiring is substantial. And so this is not to say we shouldn't be aggressively treating and aggressively diagnosing. But I think what's important for both the individual but also for STI control in the province is recognizing the role of reinfection. Finally, we also know that HIV positive men and the understanding of this is, is serosorting. So HIV positive men are having sexual partners with other HIV positive men and they are certainly our syphilis rates are highest in our HIV positive uh, population as well. Uh, we're not alone. We, uh, we see the same rates in Toronto, and we see similar uh, experiences in Seattle. And uh, we discussed that. So just to let you know, there's lots of resources for folks um, uh, helping with partner notification, helping with uh, information on the online uh, through Smart Sex Resource, and also uh, through the BCCDC and Public Health Agency of Canada website. So I'll leave it there, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions if we have time.